It is the beginning of August, and I am unbelievably behind in my production goals for the year. By the beginning of September, I normally have, you know, a good couple thousand of these tops ready to go to my wholesalers because this is my number one selling. It's just a great little, uh, you know, stocking stuffer, and it's something that even adults like to do. And I have wholesalers all over the state, hopefully soon to be all over the country. But I have to be able that the moment they call me to dump their order in the mail and get it out to them. And right now, this is all I've got. So I just went up to the hardware dealership and picked up some boards uh, to start making stock. And this is an area that, I, as always, I think people kind of don't realize the amount of thought that needs to go into producing a product, even something as simple as a little top in order to make the best product, you have to start with wood selection, getting the best product and then making a good solid blank for you to use. I'm going to be producing these little blanks right here. They're made out of six quarter hard maple. They're five and three eighths inches, which is basically five and a half inches with one saw kerf off of each side. And all that's left after I'm done, each one of these makes three tops is this, which is sitting in my chunk, truck, uh, chuck. So this is basically waste for me. Now, I could probably make uh, blanks four, five, six longer, but I have found that at my aggression level on the lathe, about three is where I want to do, because once I step out to four, I have to slow down so much, it's just not really worth my uh, time uh, in the production cycle. So three tops per blank, and that's where I'm going. And this is the same size I use for magic wands, you know, small boxes, all that kind of stuff. So making blanks in batch, taking the grain into consideration from the time I purchase the material is important. Now, the first priority of most wood turners is creating their wood blank. You know, if you're a bowl turner, maybe you have a log out there that you're going to split a certain way, you're going to cut a certain size. The blank is what we are putting on our lathe to turn. But that's totally different from what I'm doing here, you know, which is spindle turning. It might be a small top, but the techniques are the same that I would use for making a chair leg, a baseball bat, anything long where the tree um, that grew up and down, I'm turning on its side and spinning this way. The techniques are all pretty much the same. And when I'm turning at this size, I really do need the wood to be dried, which is why it's cost effective for me to just purchase a six quarter or eight quarter or even a 12 quarter board. For my uh, tops, I kind of prefer six quarter because this is a size I use for a lot of other things. Uh, Magic wand, it's a tad bit too thick for that, but a four quarter is a tad too thin for what I do. Little honey dippers, there's a lot of products I batch out for art markets I don't sell to my wholesalers that also use the same blank. But me buying the raw materials, a six quarter uh, maple, I think about it totally different than I would for buying that same board to make a tabletop or, you know, chair parts or furniture parts, that kind of stuff. So let's take a look at the board and I'll show you what I mean. Now these are just standard 10 foot high hard maple boards. Yes, again, they are six quarter. You can buy them at four quarter, eight quarter, all that kind of stuff. For those of y'all that aren't familiar with it, basically that is a measurement of rough material. This is basically straight how it comes off of the sawmill with the exception that the dealership I use skip planes it. They kind of just take off the rough stuff off the top so that you can see the grain a little bit easier. It removes a little bit material. You pay for that because that's an extra service, but I prefer it that way. Uh, now, skip planning does reduce the size. So you're not going to get a full six quarter, which is six quarter inch section, so an inch and a half. It's gonna be probably, you know, an inch and a quarter, or that kind of stuff. Now, these boards right here are not that straight. I do not care if these boards are cupped. I don't care if they are twisted or anything like that 
because I am making those short blocks. So if something twists over 10 feet, when I bring it back down to a 5 and 3 eighths inch block, that twist is almost non-existent. So I can pick boards that others would ignore, and a lot of times that gets me better material for my application. And here's what I'm looking for. I have to have straight grain coming all directions. Notice that there was a little bar, knot right there where the grain is moving. The a top made here is not going to be as good as a top made here. It will probably have a little bit of a wiggle to it. Where, see that one right there? Was probably made in a section of the tree where the grain was not perfectly straight so that the weight is not homogeneous. Whereas if I get a top that runs dead true, that one right there, that's probably made in a section where they were all very, very straight so that the weight is very balanced. And we're talking about the weight in the body, not necessarily up here. Now, I've colored it so you can't quite see, but yep, sure enough, the grain runs out the side. So when I'm picking out a board, that is what I have in mind. I'm looking for that straight grain all the way around my turning item, which means I look at things like cathedrals a lot different for this project than I would a furniture project. So here's what I mean by cathedral. You see this grain right here coming up like that? That is one growth ring of a tree that we just happen to slice down. And whenever I'm working a furniture piece, I like to find boards where the, grain, the, the cathedrals, if I'm using a flat sawn board, are all pointing in the same direction. But you will notice right here, can the camera catch that? The grain begins to reverse. This cathedral is pointing up, but right about here, it kind of evens out, and then all of a sudden the cathedrals start to point down for the rest of the way. Now for me, this would make a horrible tabletop because I work with hand tools a lot. And grain direction will happen where I will plane perfectly this way, and it's gonna get right about here, and I'll probably start getting tear out. So I'll have to reverse it around. Plus, if you're looking at cabinetry and stuff like that, having things fighting each other. You know, if I took this piece right here, it's somewhat balanced, but not perfect. But generally, you don't want the cathedrals to fight each other. So this would not be a number one selection for me for, you know, a tabletop or something like that. Maybe a chair leg or something like that. But by looking at the cathedrals, if I come over here and catch the side spot, which is the grain's nice and even, well, that tells me right there that I'm probably going to be having tear out at this spot if I'm planning this direction versus that, even though there's no cathedral there. The grain is still moving in that direction. But for me as a wood turner making these small things, I don't really care about that because this section of wood, this section of wood, that section of wood, the grain's all going to be going in the same direction. What I was more concerned about in picking this board is finding grain where the lines are fairly straight, both on the face and the side. What happens is if you had a branch, maybe over here somewhere, well, that will influence the grain. So you might have it move around a little bit, move around a little bit. And a top made from that section is going to perform horribly. And if I was turning something long and spindly, it would wobble as I was turning. It would be harder to work. And why work with material that's going to fight you if you don't have to? So I'm looking at straight grains and not caring about grain direction, if that makes sense to you. And that really is a different mentality to selecting boards than I normally take when I'm just going to buy for normal work. And using that mentality, I can actually save money by buying those crooked, twisted, all those weird ones that everybody else hates that are in the discount rack, which might actually be better for me because I don't know if you noticed this, most trees twist naturally. This is just a little side information for the, those of y'all that really dive deep in this nerd stuff of wood. But most trees grow in a spiral. And I've heard a couple different theories on that one. I, I don't know which one's actually true. They all seem to be theories. But we might look at a tree like that right there and think it's going, it just grew straight up. But normally they kind of grow like that. They kind of, 
if you look at the cells and stuff. So as you cut a tree, its natural in tendency might be to twist that, you know, quarter inch right there as it dries, because that's just how the cells grew. And some of the theories, the, the one theory that seems to be most, make most sense to me is that the trees follow the sun. So, you know, there might be one branch on this side that's a little bigger than the branch over here. And the sun doesn't pass in the same spot every single day. It kind of moves around. So this tree might, in the fast growing season, twist a little bit and then it slows down. Then it twists a little bit the next year and it slows. It's not much, but it does affect the boards we get out of it as they dry. And that might be why trees way up north probably twist a little bit more than the trees down towards the equator because the sun is going a lot farther. If somebody out there has a better explanation that makes more sense, leave it down in the comments below. But that phenomenon, it's weird. Now the first thing I need to do obviously is to break this down into more safely usable sections that can turn around to break down further into these little five and three eighths inch sections, uh, blanks. I'm going to do it the way I do it now, simply because I have the tools, I'm trying to do this efficiently because I gotta get to work making tops. But along the way, I'll also explain to it how I did this kind of processes when I didn't have as many tools, like when I was working out of an apartment. And along the way, I'll give you some tool uses tips to so you can do this safely and more efficiently. Now, as I said earlier, these are five and three eighths inches, which is basically five and a half inches long minus a kerf on each side, a saw kerf on each side. So if I have five and a half inches, double that's 11. So it just makes sense for me to uh, do 33 inches per, per section. I typically go 36, so I have a little bit of a waste on each side, and that allows me to break up this 10 foot board into more even sections. Plus a three foot section, if I divide that in half, I got two magic wands. So it just kind of works out for everything. Now, those of you all out there doing math are sitting there saying, hey, three times three is nine, not a 10 foot section. You have to understand that a lot of times these ends of the boards are cracked or trashed or something like that. They got grit in them. Uh, they are not good to run through your machines. So I'm going to be removing about four inches off of each end before I even start. That just goes straight into the bin. And that is where I come up with around that nine inches minus curves. So my first step, I'm gonna come over, I'm gonna look at the edge. This edge seems pretty good, but I'm gonna go ahead and take off two, three inches off the back just to be sure so I don't damage any of my power tool blades. Now this cut does not have to be accurate right now. But when I'm done, this blanks, these have to be perfectly 90 degrees this way and that way. There, there just can't be any error in order for me to get the best top. So right now I'm just doing a rough cut. And normally I would do this outside in the, outside off the back of my bed because of the amount of dust it makes using my circular saw. In the past, I always kept a saw in my car, uh, whether, whether I was driving the Mini Cooper or I had a Scion TC for a long time. And I could go to a lumber yard and actually break down this kind of material in the parking lot to transport it. Nowadays I have the pickup truck where I can get it here and break it down here. But this is a really good alternative because once again, at this point in time, I'm not lurking, working at pure accuracy. I'm just getting it broken apart. And since I'm going to be doing this inside to avoid the heat, I don't want to use a circular saw because it throws up too much dust. The jigsaw makes dust, but it seems to be heavier dust that doesn't linger in the air as much. So here we go. Now I can just come over here and begin taking off three foot sections or 30, four inches. I had this ruler that I use it so much, I just leave blue tape to measure it off right there. And I can just come over here. And once again, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but close enough is good enough. Oh, and this is also an advantage of making pretty much everything in your shop the same level. It works, you can stretch across stuff.
Now, as I do this, I want you to notice that I try to keep the boards organized where each board kind of stays with itself. And that'll make more sense later on. And while you're cutting off the ends, you really got to pay attention to the boards because notice this crack right here. Well, it goes all the way here. So I actually want to come back at least another two inches from that because you just want to be careful when you run this over power tools like your table saw or jointer. This is now trash for me, but everything else is going to be good. But as I'm working it, I don't want to make sure that it, it cracks off or warps or anything like that while it's going over the tool uh, to induce some kind of safety issue. So this is the time you need to really examine closely. This crack was not this long whenever I picked up this board, but it's 120 degrees outside, so it probably extended as I drove home. Oh, and staples are another reason why I always cut off the ends. Other things you gotta look for is if you see right here, I have some splits. This is either caused by drying error, more, most likely, uh, or just the tree split. But that right there is something I have to work, watch out for both whenever I'm going over power tools and this will probably be thrown away for top blanks. But also look right here. See how the grain is circling around that spot and the color changes right there? That means that this area all around here is not going to return my best tops because the grain's flowing different ways so there's less equal density throughout this section of the wood. I'll probably make a top out of that, but it, it'll probably be a little bit of a wobbler. So that's the fourth board done for me. I kept them all separate. And at this time, I'm going to kind of feel. And if they are all even, which this one doesn't count because it's got a defect in it in that it was, uh, it didn't get cut right. But all the others are even. So I don't need to worry about keeping them organized by board anymore. But if one of these was uneven, that means I could feel the height difference just any little bit, but then I would keep those three boards separate and process them later so that I don't have to change the machine settings as I do the rest of them. If they're even, one machine setting and go. And remember, that error is triple because I have three boards here. Next, I need to joint just one edge. Now, I'm not worried about getting it perfectly 90 degrees. Close enough is good enough. I do need it to be straight because you never want to work with cupped wood on the table saw. And that's what I'm going to use to make the long boards. Also, this is not the time to take dainty cuts. Go ahead and take a good, you know, 16th of an inch. So you're not here all day long. And because I only do six quarter, eight quarter quite a bit, I will adjust my fence every single time to a different part of the blades. That way I'm just not dulling one section all the time. Now some things to note, I am not using push sticks or anything like that. And if these boards are twisted or cupped, it's not going to be a perfect 90 degrees because I'm just kind of prefacing it, referencing it there. But I'm not concerned about perfect 90 degrees. I just need it straight and really over three feet, any kind of cup or twist isn't going to be that big a deal. Examine the grain. Grain's going downhill, so this goes in first. Now, a lot of times the boards I pick have waned, which means this is not going to be the primary board. So I try to always joint the side that doesn't have the wane because it'll be less waste in the long run. Because generally a lot of times I'll end up with a quarter inch sliver which just goes in the trash. And I'd rather be that be wane wood than full wood. <laughs> Now 
Now I'll start setting up the table saw to make those square uh, sticks. And this is the time I am most scared of. It used to be that I did this step on the bandsaw, and if I, when I was doing it on the bandsaw, I didn't have to worry about jointing or anything like that. The flexion of the bandsaw blade would move and it'd take care of itself. And that was pretty much good enough for what I was doing back then, but as my quality of my tops has gotten better and better and better, and I just needed to process a lot more, that's where the table saw came in. And for the longest time, I was just using a contractor saw, but now that I have this one, I. I enjoy using it more, though well, I can't tell you that the sticks come out any better. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the blade, and that is being raised so just, you know, half a kerf is above the thing, basically the, the tooth. I do have the angle set at 90 degrees, so what I'll do now is I'll come up and I'll put the board on the side right like that, push it up against there, get it straight, and I can bring the fence over and snug it up. So I now know that the width is going to cut the same as the height, and that'll make me a square thing. Why well, measure if you don't have to? Now, in this application, I feel safe enough using a push stick instead of something like a, you know, the gripper or a homemade stick or something like that, because I'm pretty much staying far away. Whenever I'm pushing it through, I want to stay to this side. Of the, of the thing in case any kickback is going to come back this way. I do not want to stand right here because I want to protect the jewels. Next, this is one of those things that it's a feel that you need to develop, but hard maple more than any wood I work has some movement to it. And the more you remove for it, I remove a little bit on this side. This side of the board has a lot of power to flex it. So a lot of times about halfway through the cut, it might start binding up. And then it's kind of a commitment. Either I'm going to bump and turn the saw off, lift it up and come the other way to finish the cut. So I'll basically, if I get halfway through this way, I'll, I'll stop the blade, I'll lift it off, I'll flip the board around this way and come through to finish the cut. In that situation, I need to rejoint this, okay? So I will set aside that board, and then after I do everything else, I'll go rejoint the ones I need to, and then recut it. And on some boards this thickness, I might have to rejoint twice. That's the worst I've ever had. But if your blade starts binding up or anything like that, it's best to turn the saw off, remove it, and then flip it around to finish that cut, and then rejoint because pushing a, a board that's already told you it's going to be warping as you cut it, with the warp in it, bad things are going to happen. So from here, I've got my jointed edge. It's going against the fence. I'm going to be standing back pushing. My front hand is going to be pressing against the table. My back hand just kind of feels for the level, and then it just, we just go through. And I'm going to have dust collection and the saw running, so you, I probably won't be able to talk as I do this. Now, I want to stop here and point something out. You saw me, whenever I was doing this, I pushed all the way through and off the table, and I push this to the side so that both halves are away. It irks me so much when I see even some of the top woodworkers out there on YouTube, they're doing a cut, they're pushing through, and they stop here in the camera. Let everything go. That is just scary to me because it doesn't take much for that to become a rocket shooting past your blade. Push it off the table if it's all possible, but at least past your riving fence and make sure this side is clear. You don't want anything vibrating back and hitting a blade. Just pet peeve of mine when I'm seeing people do all the safety features, but they just don't push their work fully, fully past the blade. Also, as I'm doing this, I'm listening for the motor. I have a one and three quarter horsepower motor with a sharp blade, eight quarter, 12 quarter maple, it's, it can do it easily. But if the motor starts slowing down, 
That's what I mean by bogging, because there's friction. So I will either slow my pressure to see that if that alleviates it. If that does, I just keep going. If it doesn't alleviate it, I need to start watching for hitting that stop button uh, or just getting through. And that's that. I'll just keep at it until I get through the stack and we'll come back and I'll show you, show you how to cut them down. There are some tricks to that too. Now a common question new woodworkers on the table saw have is how fast do you push the boards through the wood? And a lot of us will tell you, you kind of develop a feel for it. But I'm going to use a, a bad habit of mine to explain a principle, okay? Because basically if you see burning on your boards, caramelization of the sugars or flat out heat induced black thinning, you know that you're going too slow. There's too much friction developing up. Because a saw blade uses sawdust to take away the heat. It's somewhat lubricating. And if the sawdust is kind of sticking in one area, that's where you get caramelization. Well, in my normal pet use of pushing a board through, shifting around and grabbing my tool stick and then pushing that last little bit through, I kind of slow down those last six inches. And time and time again, you will see a little bit of burring in that last six inches of my board. I noticed that I just never really corrected the habit or really focused on it too much because it's not too bad, but it illustrates a point that at that last little bit, I've slowed down enough that it's burning, which means for the rest of the board, I'm pretty much at a level where I'm teetering on burning. So you kind of hit this point whether the engine is bogging or, and you have to slow down or the wood is burning, so you need to speed up. And if you can't speed up because your engine's bogging down, that's when you've outgrown the machine for that particular board at that particular time. Again, I do know that this three quarter horsepower, I've done eight quarter and 12 quarter hard maple in the past. And yes, I do get burning the bigger ones a lot more than here, but it gets the work done, but it's working it pretty hard. Next step, we're going to set up for making the blanks out of those ripped pieces. Now, when I was using both my bandsaw, my original uh, contractor table saw, I just made a, a sled for that one and I put pencil lines for the, uh, l the length I needed and just kind of eyeballed it. And that, that's good enough for what we were doing. And in actuality, once I got a miter saw, I, I would do it that way. And that is by far the fastest way to cross cut all these things. That's what a miter saw is meant to do. You can actually grab four or five of them all at once and cut them down. Just put stop box out here. But I don't like uh, messing with glass clavis next door. So I've been doing it on the table saw. And this will give me a good opportunity to show you a good way to set up for cross cuts. Now. The worst thing you could do is I need something this thick, so I come over here, I come over, I grab my table fence, come back over, and now I'm gonna make these cross cuts. You never want the off cut to be trapped between the blade and the fence because it will, bad things will happen. In fact, you don't want it to be able to, you want it to be able to rotate freely around, kind of like that, to be safe. Because worst case scenario, it'll bounce around and you come back in, less likely to come back. The farther that distance, the safer it's gonna be. Now, what I typically like to do in this situation is I will grab myself a magnet, I'll bring this over here, and I'll drop that down. The problem I have is this rail happens to be right where the distance I want. So what I need to do is I grab a one, two, three block. I put that down right here. I put my magnet on it like that, and then I line my fence up to the magnet. Boom. Now I can bring this all down and put the magnet wherever I want, lock it down so it's not moving anywhere, and I can now have as much free space for the merchandise to bounce around as I want on this side. It's the ultimate safe position. 
I then also will set up a stop lock on this side for that way. That way I'm going to be safe making cuts on that side of the blade to the distance and this side of the blade to the distance. The key thing on this side is you don't want to be able to start the cut while it is touching your reference point. Now I will typically grab three boards at a time. My first cut is just going to kiss the end. It's just taking a curve off the end and that's going to give me that perfectly square cut this way and that way. So it's square this way and square that way. And then I just progress and cut through the board. Now I will say these are easily stored in this kind of format. So if I knew I wasn't going to be turning this entire stack into tops in the next couple months, I might leave them like this because it gives me the option of cutting them into halves or thirds for other projects. For example, a lot of times I will cut them in half to make a solid magic wand, or I might cut it into quarters to make a handle out of this and then the wand out of a stick or something like that. So it gives me options for other products, but I know that these are all gonna to be tops, so I'm just gonna cut the whole stack. And there we go. I guess I have a little bit of work cut out for me now, uh, but I think it's important to realize that there's a lot of thought that goes into the starting process, how you choose a board, how you choose lumber, even if it's not a board, and how you progress through the steps. Each step, there are a lot of decisions that I don't think everybody considers fully before they go, and that shows up in the end result. In my end result, if I didn't do all this, I would have a bunch of wobbly tops. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Picked up a new few tips and tricks right there. But in the end, remember, it's always worth the effort to learn new stuff, create new things, and share it with others. If you like the idea, there are t-shirts available just down below. Be safe. Have fun.